So I thought I'd start off with this painting, which I came across in Vienna, uh, The Butterfly Hunter. But to me, um, this is, uh, if you like, a representation of an evolutionary biologist, or at least an evolutionary biologist like myself that work in the field. I regret I don't often get to the field these days, but I used to a lot. Um, and what we're doing now is, in most cases, combining our work in the field with our work in the lab. Um, I, I, want, I thought of this title about six months ago when I was badgered to think up a title for a third one of these talks. Um, so thoughts on why the science of natural history must contribute to evolution and ecology. And it sounded like a quite good title, um, particularly because, as you've all also heard today, the Linnaean Society of London is a forum for natural history. And I think that does indeed summon up the society brilliantly. And what I want to try and do today is to put that, if you like, into a modern context of why I believe um, natural history is still absolutely or must be at the heart of evolutionary and ecological research. Another phrase I found on the website very quickly was a continuous forum for the discussion and advancement of the life sciences. And that's more about what I'm talking about, the foundation of the life sciences. Um, what is natural history? And if you, if you Google it, there are umpteen uh, definitions out there. I thought this one was pretty good. But um, so natural history is the domain of inquiry, a bit wordy, involving organisms, including animals, fungi, plants, others, as we've heard, and their environment. And I love the fact that the environment is in there. Um, I'm not so happy with the next phrase, leaning more towards observational than experimental methods of study. I would certainly argue that both the observational and the experimental are absolutely crucial in a modern description of the science of natural history. And I do work with butterflies and some other organisms, and so I, I'm not going to apologize for me turning this title and using butterflies to try and um, give you an idea. But first of all, another painting I discovered in uh, Madrid recently, which I just fell in love with. To me, it encapsulates uh, how we, um, as a community, um, are perhaps beginning to miss what we saw in my childhood, but certainly in childhoods up until relatively recently, that kids love hunting around in their gardens or their woods or wherever on the pavement and finding yeah, creepy crawlies. And to my mind, this painting, which I hadn't known about, is just a wonderful encapsulation of everything Sir David Attenborough would love us to talk about. And just to mention this Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, which I want to advertise, we will be fully open on June the 23rd, so in four or five weeks' time. And um, what we are about is we have a young zoologist club with several thousand members, and we are about infusing um, everybody of every age, but particularly, if you like, uh, young children, to, be, um, to develop a fascination for natural history. Um, I was very fortunate. I, I've never collected, I've never, although I'm director of a museum, I've actually never or virtually never stuck a pin in a butterfly. I've always bred them. And when I was 10, my parents gave me the Young Naturalist book and the book called Looking at Butterflies, which I think is a wonderful title um, by this character, L. Hugh Newman, and he was a character. He was a bit of a shark, I understand. But he did, his father had set up a butterfly farm in 1894. And as a child of 10, I started buying eggs of British swallowtails and so on from him and breeding them at home. And I, I just think that a lot of bioscientists Actually, at least of my generation, started life with very similar interests, whether it was butterflies or orchids or whatever, or a mixture of natural history, and I certainly did. But we have this, in, in the modern life sciences, we have this extraordinary power now relative to when I was a student to delve using these amazing tools, particularly at the molecular level, 
um, in ever more detail into every level of what makes up the life sciences, what makes up the ecologies of communities out there. Whether it's the genome, whether it's genes and mutations in those particular genes. Um, actually, the, the mutation, this big eye mutation in our butterflies maps to exactly the same genome, sorry, the exactly the same locus, the gene called cortex, which uh, this group in Liverpool have recently shown is the basis of the gene that produces melanism in the pepper moth, Biston betularia. So this species, which has been beloved of evolutionary biologists for a very long time, is still carrying us into the modern era. We can identify the mutation in the particular gene which produced the first black moths in Manchester. And what I find quite extraordinary is that same gene is involved in producing wing pattern evolution in totally different species of Lepidoptera, whether are African bicyclists or Heliconius as well. And I, I would argue, personally at least, that research on only some of these levels, whether it's one or uh, several of these levels, is ultimately limiting that what you really need to do is to link all these levels together. And what often tends to be underlit is the environment. Genes interact with the environment. We have these wonderful um, genomic, epigenomic tools now to look at ever more detail at the DNA sequence, but ultimately to understand how those genes have evolved, we need to understand what they're doing in natural environments. Um, so what I want to tell you a little bit about is um, how we study evolution by working on butterflies. I'm not actually going to talk mostly about my own research, but I want to give you a sort of potted history of uh, research on butterflies. Um, and I want to do that using a series of butterfly conferences. And I'm, I'm sorry not to see Dick Bain Wright tonight. He always comes to these meetings, but he hasn't come tonight because he knew I was talking. Um, <laughs> and I will show you why in a minute. And, and the escalating research effort that has used butterflies and will continue to use butterflies, even in the face of fruit flies and nematode worms. You can still do, well, you can increasingly do things with butterflies that are, in my view, much more satisfactory than um, what a lot of people are doing with fruit flies. And I'm going to tell you, if I have time, a very short story with our Michael E. Sign butterflies. And butterfly biology, uh, it just it's just full of natural history because they have these wonderful life cycles with different stages which have very different ecologies, uh, metamorphosis. Um, the larvae almost always feed on plants, so you have to know something about plants if you're going to be interested in butterflies and the evolution and ecology of butterflies. They also pollinate. They, for, they, they form one component of this ecosystem services of pollinating uh, flowers many other features. And to my mind, it, it does encapsulate a, a fascinating natural history. So you all know Dick. I mean, I don't need to introduce him, but this is Dick um, with a typical glass of beer in his hand. And Dick did a wonderful service for butterfly biology when he organized, in chief at least, the very first of these biology of butterflies meeting in London. And it was the first time I'd had to give a talk at an international meeting, so you can imagine how nervous I was. But it, it was a great meeting, and there was a bit of a gap after that. But since then, our community, several hundred um, people, uh, gather together every few years in uh, often very exciting places around the world, um, India in a month's time in June. Uh, Blank, are you going to India? Where are you? Are you going? Oh. Um, so thanks to Dick um, for setting this up. Um, there's a wonderful uh, website which uh, I have parasitized many of the ancient photographs from. And there's also a history of the meetings which um, these three characters on the right, so including Dick, put together for arrival of our Linnaean Pulse antenna from the Royal Entomological Society. So just to, what, what I'm going to do is to show you a few pictures of um, people from 
that first meeting, but extended into what has happened in different fields of butterfly biology since then. But this is this wonderful orange book, which one of my students has pinched from me, and I can't get it back. But th these are worth a fortune on eBay, of course. Um, <laughs> And you know, again, Dick and Philip Ackery here were wonderful organizers of the first meeting. Uh, this is Cyril Clark. Uh, you, if you're a biologist of butterflies, you, you know all these people. Um, it was pretty male dominated, but there were a few, as I will show you, ladies present. Um, one of my heroes has always been E.B. Ford, way before I um, was an undergraduate, because I read this book the butterflies, and you all know the new naturalist series. I'm sure almost everybody in this room has at least some copies on your bookcases. In my view, an absolutely amazing series, which is essentially about natural history, of course. And uh, Henry Ford wrote the very first uh, volume of that series. But it was this book that grabbed my attention, because I read it um, before going up to uh, university. Um, and he and Theodore Dobzhansky basically were extremely influential in developing this field um, called ecological genetics, which is a bit passe now because it's been incorporated into many other modern bits of jargon. But these people came from an animal ecology, plant ecology background where populations were thought of as being individuals all of the same phenotype, all of the same genotype. And these people began to think about the consequences that populations were actually made up of many individuals of different phenotypes and different genotypes. And I was totally grabbed by that concept. And um, E.B. Ford again, but also Ronald Fisher, they, they, as I suspect almost all of you are aware, used butterflies to develop the most amazing tools that we you have used uh, consistently over decades, whether it's working with butterflies, with uh, any other organism. Um, mark release recapture tools and the statistics to go with analyzing the data. And they have been profoundly important in understanding population dynamics, movements of individuals within populations, among populations, if you like, the spatial structuring of populations. And I did my thesis on this little brown meadow brown butterfly, which has these tiny little spots on the wings. And I'm glad to say that a group recently published with uh, Simon Baxter from Cambridge, but from other biologists from Exeter, have revisited the Isles of Scilly, which was very famous for setting up this work with the mark release recapture and the, um, the ecological genetics of the meadow brown. And using modern tools, they've actually been able to look at how similar the populations are on different islands in the Scillies. And also, they've resampled the islands and compared the distribution of these spot patterns on the wings across several decades. So it's great to see, for me at least, to see this happening. OK, and I just wanted to tell you that April, May the 10th, so it's not now the most current nature but nature, as you know, is the, the summit of uh, our publication efforts. And it's great to see a butterfly on the front cover. And Mike Singer, who was at the original 1981 meeting in London, and his uh, wife now, Camille Parmesan, have published a brilliant paper on this North American fritillary-like butterfly. They call them checker spots. No idea why we call them fritillaries. Um, and they've monitored this population for 17 generations. And I would argue that what they're doing feeds back to not just Henry Ford, but his father, who studied um, fluctuations in the populations of these marsh fritillary butterflies up in the Lake District. And it's, I think it's very exciting that you can feed this work back through uh, Paul Ehrlich and right back to... Uh, E.B. Ford and his father, and you can see how these modern approaches have developed out of the original, incredibly careful, natural history-based uh, ecological work. Um, the other thing butterflies have that follows on from their incredibly rich natural history 
is there are many species which we can bring into the lab. We can use modern genetic tools with. We have whole genome sequences of quite a few of these butterflies, and at least some of them can be kept in long-term cultures with experimental evolution in the lab. Um, they also, as we've heard in some of these prizes from Dan Danahar and others, they also have um, a huge uh, appeal to everyone, but also to entomologists, whether they're professional or amateur. And they have this fantastic um, resource of very uh, wonderful faunistic books, not just on the British butterflies and European butterflies, but now more or less all around the world. So that's an incredible resource. And I would argue that these species and others, which perhaps we haven't yet started working on in the lab, are wonderful systems for linking research in the field, real ecology and natural environments, or sometimes secondary environments, and in the lab. Um, and that's really, they're not the only organisms you can do that with, but they certainly are very good ones. And I would also, uh, Dick and Philip were both, uh, are both uh, taxonomists and system systematicists. Blanca here is following the wonderful tradition of the BM natural history. But it, it is still the case that systematics and modern phylogenetic reconstructions that we've all, all heard about this evening as well um, are an absolute foundation of what I would say, all good things that come from butterflies. So it's natural history plus our ability to tell um, how to describe how these species are related one to another. And we have some fossils now so we can date these phylogenies. Um, perhaps, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm reluctant to say this uh, because I don't work with this system, but it really is the case that perhaps the highest profile um, uh, model system is these wonderful Heliconius butterflies, um, which I, I actually worked on in Ecuador for a year, many, many years ago. And I again would argue that the modern work on these Heliconius uh, um, goes right back to John Turner at this 1981 meeting. And um, what he did followed on from Muller and Bates and other people interested in um, mimicry. This is Philip Shepherd, who did wonderful genetics, classical genetic analysis of the amazing color variation in these patterns. And this work has, has gone on to be truly, I think, revolutionary. So we can, we can again map the genes in the genome of these Heliconius species. Um, we can understand how supergenes have evolved in these systems. Uh, we can study the development of the wing patterns in wonderful detail. We can um, identify at least many of the signaling genetic pathways involved in establishing these beautiful color patterns, but also <coughs> establishing how this pattern evolves into a very different pattern. Um, and again, just to show a few modern people, there's Jim Mallet there, Chris Jiggins, and Bob Reed, and uh, is that Larry Gilbert in the middle, I think? So um, this biology has grown from Bates and Muller to um, what was happening in the middle part of the last century right through to um, the most modern of approaches taken today. But these people still go into the field and study natural history and ecology in the field. So great. Um, Chemical ecology was another area that was developing in 1981. This is Michael Bopre. Um, these are the Browers, Jane, Jane Brower and Lincoln Brower. It's the only photograph I could find of Jane Brower. And as you know, these people worked with the monarch. Um, and uh, they've used chemical ecology to understand a lot more about how the mimicry works um, how these uh, species interact with predators, and now increasingly um, the uh, biology of mate choice and courtship. This is an incredibly famous front cover where the Browers uh, raised naive shrub jays in the lab and fed them for the first time these uh, incredibly uh, toxic monarch butterflies, and this is one being extremely sick and looking quite intelligent here. And 
the amazing thing with these J's is that the vast majority only have to uh, have this experience once and they will learn for a long time to avoid butterflies with that wing pattern. But of course, being biology, other species, unrelated species, have shown this amazing Batesian mimicry where they've evolved to resemble the toxic species so that they're protected, at least in part, from bird predators. Wonderful biology, wonderful natural history, and of course the monarch is also the subject of work on one of the most uh, extraordinary migratory behaviours in any animal. Uh, co I, I can go on forever. I mean, coevolution and species interactions, again, entirely driven by natural history, but where we can increasingly, uh, I shouldn't say we, where people working in that field can increasingly use uh, a number of model species and the plants or the insects they interact with to study how this works. A lot of people, Jeremy Thomas, you'll recognize Mike Singer again, um, Paul Ehrlich, but modern Naomi Pierce was also, I believe, at that first meeting. So um, that's another area where I think uh, butterfly biology taking on seminal work um, has really sort of um, grown into the most fantastic demonstration of how coevolutionary relationships evolve. Um, I think somebody mentioned transect walks, but there are other techniques out there which were developed from butterfly natural history. This is Ernie Pollard, which Jeremy says is uh, the phrase, where the phrase comes from doing the Pollard walk, and you should sing it to the song of Lambeth Walk. Um, but Ernie, um, ha he was the person who, working at Monk's Wood, developed this incredibly simple tool for monitoring um, butterfly numbers, which is spread right around the world. Um, Phil de Vries here, who was in uh, the 1981 meeting, and some modern uh, trappers, uh, developed uh, with mathematical biologists like Russ Landy um, on the statistical side, wonderful uh, systems for monitoring the, um, the ecosystem biology of a guild of butterflies, which we have very few of in northern Europe, but in the tropics, many butterflies feed on fruit. You can track them very easily, and you can get the most fantastically rich um, data sets, which enable you to look at, for example, how species adapt to seasonal changes. Um, spatial ecology, following up a little bit what I said before and the conservation sciences, this is again a wonderful example of linking natural history, field and lab work with a modeling approach to produce a system of great power, not just in butterflies of course, but butterflies, thanks to Ilka Hamsky, and Ilka died recently and the field owes him a huge debt. He was a wonderful person but also an absolutely extraordinary person at linking mathematical modeling approaches with um, using an army, literally, of Finnish undergraduate students to monitor several hundred populations of this lovely uh, fritillary, which we call the Glanville fritillary. But Je I can't go without saying something about Jeremy. We all know um, Jeremy's uh, story of being able to use modern techniques, but also brilliant natural history to study how the ecology of the large blue actually works and to use that information to develop conservation. Um, I think this is the last uh, one that I really want to mention because I can't do this without mentioning climate change biology where I think butterflies are also uh, an extremely important system uh, thanks to people like Chris Thomas, Jane Hill who gave one of the evening lectures to the Linnaean Society recently. This is Carmel Parmesan again. Um, this is actually a, a thesis which was written by one of my students in Holland um, where we released, uh, we reintroduced two species of Maculinia into the Netherlands. This is the Minister of the Environment releasing the first butterflies which were collected in Poland. These species have both gone extinct in the Netherlands and very similar to the large blue story. Um, PhD students and others, this is Jan van der Maarde from the uh, Dutch equivalent of butterfly conservation, 
grouped their resources together, studied the ecology at some great sites, um, and discovered how to manage those sites to be able to reintroduce these two species of Maculinia very successfully. They're both still around in those localities. Um, and as you all know, um, changes in phenology and the timing of uh, the appearance of these butterflies, as well as range extensions, whether in higher latitudes or higher altitudes, is really providing us with great information on the consequences of climate change. So I think I've got another, yeah, I've got 10 minutes. So I'm going to tell you one little story from our, but our own butterfly work. Um, so um, as I've told you previously, we work on these Michael Eastine butterflies, the little brown jobs of the butterfly world. So the sparrows or the, the mice of the butterfly world. Um, again, Sam Berry would appreciate that, I think. Um, so there are 350, actually it's growing all the time. I have somebody in my team called Oscar Bratstrom who adds species every few months as far as I can see. Um, but anyway, there are a large number of these butterflies in the old world tropics. There are radiations in sub-Saharan Africa, these bicyclist species, but also on Madagascar and also several in Asia. And... Um, hmm. I don't know why it's suddenly decided to do that. Um, we can bring these, or uh, well, several of these species into the lab, raise them in very large numbers very quickly so we can do experimental evolution. But this is Oscar, who's been a very important person in our lab. I think he knows more about these butterflies um, than anybody else alive. Um, he can tell you what almost all the 350 species are, which I definitely cannot. And he does these uh, trapping um, field work, um, brings the species back. Um, we breed some of them, but we can study their biology at every level. Um, and what I just want to mention is this, I think, absolutely riveting topic of phenotypic plasticity. Um, most of us of a certain age learned that a genotype produces a phenotype and that phenotype might have consequences for fitness. Um, but I very early on got really interested in the idea that there were these species that exhibit phenotypic plasticity, where each individual in a population can produce alternative phenotypes. One genotype can produce a range of phenotypes. Um, so that raises all sorts of issues. How does a genome produce different phenotypes? Um, sometimes those phenotypes can be discrete forms, and you all probably know this wonderful example of the map butterfly, Arachnia lugana, which unfortunately is not a British species, but you just have to cross the channel, and it's, uh, it's in Finland all the way around to northern France. And uh, you know, Linnaeus... Uh, had an interesting role here. Um, but these two alternating generations, one in the spring, one in the summer, have these fantastically discrete phenotypes. Uh, one looks like a fritillary and one looks like, rather like a white admiral. Um, but all the eggs laid by females, whether of that form or the other form, can develop these two different phenotypes. And I just find that absolutely fascinating. Um, in this example, and also in our African butterflies, um, the different, the alternative phenotypes are associated with alternating environments, with alternating seasons. So why do they produce those differences? Why is one form associated with one season and one with another? But equally fascinating, how do they do it? How does a genotype receive information which switches the development into one of these forms. And why does that system work and not make mistakes uh, in terms of the wrong form being produced in the wrong season? And there were many early entomologists, Poulton was one of them, who were interested or fascinated in butterflies in both tropical wet and dry seasons, which is where our species are often found. 
And this is just a list of some species where, sorry, some examples where uh, a form in the dry season and a form in the wet season were described as different species. So this was the regular um, story from taxonomy and systematics in that time. Um, and there was, there's actually a person I'd never heard of until Oscar discovered this, uh, Lionel de Niceville, um, who in 1885 uh, made this list which I've just shown you, and he suspected that these were seasonal forms, that they were actually the same species. And this is going way back, and he actually did breeding experiments which upheld his suspicions and showed that these were examples of where, as I say, one genome can produce two very different wing patterns, but we now know they produce very different life histories, very different um, phenotypes at all levels, whether it's behavior or whether it's wing pattern or metabolism. Um, and actually both these are this species, are now recognized as this species, Michaelitis, Michaelitis maidus. Um, so our system, I'm sure why it's doing that. So our system is in Africa where you get wet season with rains, obviously, and the dry season. Um, and the environment changes dramatically. But these species have to exist as adult butterflies in each of these seasons. And this is one of these species by Cyclist Savitsa. These are two, two full sisters. And the only difference is that this individual has been reared in the late caterpillar stage at a low temperature, whereas this um, very highly related individual was reared at a high temperature before pupation in the late caterpillar stage. So the wet season is green and it's also warm. And there's lar the, 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 la the larval food plants are grasses, so there are um, larval food plants uh, in abundance. The dry season is cool, at least at the beginning, and it's basically brown, and the butterflies rest on the, the leaf litter on the ground, and they're long-lived, they have to survive six, eight months before they can breed at the beginning of the rains. And we know now that uh, temperatures decline in the early dry season when the caterpillars are developing that will produce this generation of these butterflies. And so the larvae use the declining temperature as a predictive cue and to steer development in the direction of knocking out the ice box. This one's <coughs> hidden at rest um, and to produce adults of the dry season form. And I, I would argue very forcefully that observing these species in the field in Africa a long time ago now led to understanding the natural history sufficiently to be able to ask the right uh, questions in terms of exploring the how, the mechanisms that produce this ability, but also the why questions. Why do they produce the differences? Um, and just very quickly, why have butterflies on um, wings? I want to show you a paper which is recent, not from our group, um, which uh, I think has done some very nice experimental work. Um, lots of photographs of predation of uh, butterflies. And the idea with these ice spots along the edge of the wing, this is a British ringlet or one of our bicyclists. In the, in the field, you can find lots of individuals of the wet season form that have pieces of their wings torn away. And the idea indeed is that these eye spots deflect the attacks of birds and lizards, at least sometimes away from the vulnerable body towards the edge of the wing. These edges tear very readily. The butterfly can at least sometimes escape and still reproduce. Males mate, females lay eggs. Some other eye spots, such as the peacock butterfly, have a different function. They startle or frighten predators away when those eye spots are suddenly exposed. And we also know now that these wing patterns are involved in mate choice. But just lastly, to show you this um, experiment, uh, which was done by Antonia Montero and her team, um, you have the dry season form and the wet season form. This sh I'm not sure why that's turned up. Um, but instead of these, you should be seeing a praying mantis. But why on earth those have appeared? I don't know. Those are not praying mantises. Anyway, dry season form, wet season form, 
one of the predators, at least in Asia, are these praying mantis. Um, Antonia had a lab culture of them. Um, what is very nice is that um, the dry season, the wet season forms, uh, let me get this right, um, this shows the, uh, how long it takes the praying mantis to attack the butterflies of these alternative forms. And where the butterflies have eye spots, as in the wet season form, they're attacked much quicker than the dry season form. Um, but they also escape the attacks more effectively. Um, and that, that's a very well conducted experiment. But the other thing that's very nice is in the wet season form here, many of the attacks are to the edge of the hind wings. They are directed by the eye spots to the edge of the wings. Whereas in the dry season form, the majority of attacks are directly at the abdomen and the thorax, so the predator has got a good chance of grabbing a morsel of food. So I think that again illustrates how natural history, in my view, you can take into the lab, design clever experiments, Nico Timberg said this uh, decades ago, and you can then um, test your hypotheses developed from the field observation. I just want to finish by saying that one of the people at this 1981 meeting in London was one of my heroes, Torben Larsen, who actually had a high power job with um, the UN um, working on family planning all around the world and he produced in his spare time the most amazing butterfly fauna books from all around the world, including one from West Africa, which has been amazingly useful to us. Um, he died recently, um, so he was a great uh, butterfly biologist and when I talked at the London meeting about these pathetic little spots on Meadow Browns, he said, why don't you go to Africa and get interested in these seasonal forms where you have these major alternative patterns of eye spots produced by, as I've said, the same genotype in the same species. So thanks to Dick, but uh, in particular thanks to Torben. He grabbed me after my talk and we went to a pub in South Kensington and spent the whole evening talking about these uh, butterflies. So butterfly research, I would argue, um, punches way above its weight. I didn't want to put um, way above here, but it does, I think, punch way above its weight. And that is founded, again in my view, on the amazing strength of butterfly natural history, and not just professionals, in fact, mainly not professionals, amateurs. And it really does make all the links from genes to phenotype, and then from phenotype to fitness, and from fitness in variation in individual species to whole ecosystems, as we've heard, climate change and all the rest of it. So I would argue that it's exceptional in the power of applying these integrative approaches, combining the different levels of biological research. And at the same time, I, it, it can engage, it continues to engage public um, awareness of challenges to our environment. Perhaps that's much more important than it was 40, 50 years ago. But, um, and so I think the Linnaean Society must continue to grow in relevance as a forum for natural history. And I, I'm totally confident that it will do as well. So thank you. And I just want to finish by, uh, I, I'm absolutely thrilled that Sandy Knapp is taking over. Um, she'll give uh, people on committees a much more difficult job than I ever have. Um, uh, but she is really great news for the society. So um, I wish her every success in meeting all these challenges. And I shall look forward to coming back very regularly and seeing how the society is managing. So thank you very much. Um, we've got a little bit of meeting to go, but then uh, we can all go and have a well-deserved drink. So thank you. Thank you.